I am so excited that next Sunday at all of our campuses, Keller, West Fort Worth, and North Richard Hills, we will have baptism Sunday. And I just can't encourage you enough uh, to get baptized next Sunday. Go on our website, go to thehills.org slash baptism and sign up. Invite your family, invite your closest friends. All of us should bring a guest next week to witness the powerful act of people confessing Christ publicly and being baptized. It's going to be a wonderful day. Pray about it every day this week. Well, welcome to the Hills, all of you in person at our campuses and all of you online. My name is Rick, and I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of the First Peter, find the second chapter, and we'll be there in a moment. I've been the senior teaching minister of this church for over 30 years, but my first preaching ministry for over 10 years was in Abilene, Texas, and I got to know a lot of the local churches and pastors and hear their stories. And here's one of my favorite. Out in the country, there was a sweet little Baptist church that for years was faithfully served by a pastor that everyone just loved for many reasons, one of which is that every Sunday service began at 11 o'clock and it was over by 12 o'clock. Basically, he did not preach very long. It came time for him to retire. He was replaced by a young man out of seminary, a fine young man, but he tended to preach much longer than the former pastor and the church was struggling to adjust to it. True story. He's been there a few months. He's preaching, going on and on, and he mentions a name of a man in the church as an example of faithful Christian living. It was an older man who was hard of hearing. He heard his name. Many times in the past, the former pastor had called him to lead closing prayer. <laughs> he heard his name. He stood up in the middle of the young pastor's sermon. He led a closing prayer. And when he said amen, the church got up and walked out. <laughs> Don't you be getting any ideas during my sermon. But it does raise an interesting question. Is there a Christian way to shut people up? And the answer is yes, there is. And in fact, we are called to do it. We've talked about living hope in the salvation of God and in the holiness of God today, in the calling of God. I remind you what we've already seen is that Peter is writing to people regularly referring to them as exiles and foreigners and strangers, but they are living where they've lived all their lives. What has made them strange is that their acceptance of Jesus as Lord has changed their behaviors and their convictions. And Peter wants them to hold on to that strangeness. So notice in chapter two, starting verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now there's so much in those two verses to unpack, but I want to lean into one phrase. Though they accuse you. Now, Christians often feel like we are unfairly portrayed in the media, but this is not a new problem. From the earliest days, Christians have been the subject of a lot of bad and unfair press. More on that later. But how do you respond when you realize that as a Christian community, you are surrounded by neighbors that often look at you critically and even with hostile impression? And two common responses are to isolate or to accommodate. And Peter rejects both strategies. He rejects accommodation. He calls his readers foreigners and exiles, and he encourages them to remain odd for God. But if you feel odd for God, there's a temptation then to isolate, to withdraw into a Christian ghetto and pull away from the community, and he rejects that as well. Notice he says, I want you to live among your pagan neighbors, not aloof from your pagan neighbors. I want you to live in, but not sell out. You see, Jesus' strategy is incarnational. He's reaching nations through communities of resident aliens embedded within them. He's calling us out of the world that he can send us back into the world to rescue our neighbors from the brokenness of the world. So he says, live such good lives among your neighbors that they may see your good 
deeds. And here's the idea, that goodness validates oddness. That good lives give credibility to odd ways of living. And so three times in the text we're going to see today, Peter is simply going to say, do good. Let them notice you are different. But make them admit that your presence makes a difference. You know, we're asking God for nations and generations. And that's one reason why in a few weeks we're going to have a new serve day. And we're going to go into our city and we're going to do good in the neighborhood. And then we're going to take up a new offering and we're going to give every dollar away to partner agencies that are trying to bless our community. We're going to live in our city as different kind of people. But we're going to make a difference in our city as well. And here's how Peter puts it. For it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, we typically want a different strategy. We typically want our arguments to silence the actions of godless people. Instead of letting our actions silence the arguments of godless people people. But the reason Peter is emphasizing actions is because he's writing to people who often did not have a voice. What we're going to see today is that Peter is going to address three distinct groups of people who were on the margins, who do not have a seat at the table, who do not have a voice. He's going to address citizens under a godless government, slaves under pagan masters, and wives under unbelieving husbands. That's right. Today we're going to talk about politics, slavery, and marriage. And right away I'm thinking, I'm the senior minister. Why didn't I assign this text to Taylor and let him deal with it? (laughs) But let's go back to the bad press the first Christians were getting. You see... Rome's empire was built on loyalty to Caesar. And Christians would not say Caesar is Lord. They said Jesus is Lord. The talk on the street is that this will promote sedition. They are disloyal. And they will upset the civic order. And if a slave becomes a Christian and starts saying, Jesus is my real master, he might become insolent. And this will upset the entire economic order. And if a wife starts insisting that she is married to Christ, she will defy her husband and upset the entire social order. In short, the slander on the street was that this little cult could potentially upset the fabric of our entire society. And Peter says, We need to shut this talk up. And so he has an action that he suggests. And some of you are not going to like it. Because three times he's going to use the word submit. Now we struggle with the word submit. And one reason is because we rightly view all human beings as equals. But please understand, we do so because we've been influenced by 20 centuries of Christian thought. The idea that all human beings are equal is a Christian idea introduced to the world. No one in Peter's day thought this way. And so as we read these admittedly uncomfortable texts, I want you to keep in mind Peter's world. And keep in mind, he is addressing these house churches that are filled with the voiceless. He's talking about these issues because these churches are filled with slaves and with women who did not find his words to be harsh and oppressive. 
They found them to be revolutionary and empowering. So let's begin. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And so the first use of the word is that to submit for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Peter says human government, not Christian human government, human government is tasked by God to be responsible for the material and the moral well-being of its citizens. That the job of government, Peter says, is to commend what is right and to punish what is wrong. Which, by the way, suggests that there are moral absolutes that any people group and government should be able to recognize. And if there is a moral law that all should recognize, there should be a moral law giver. But Christians want government to flourish. Because nations suffer when governments don't do their job and tolerate or promote evil. Because evil is inherently self-destructive. And the great empires of the world have collapsed, not from the outside, but from the inside. They imploded because of moral decay. And so we pray for government. We want our government to thrive so that people can thrive. And one way we do this as Christians is we are a voice for what is good. So when Peter says submit, He's not saying that believers should never challenge injustice tolerated or promoted by human governments. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was right to speak out against the Nazi regime, just like Dr. King was right to stand against the unjust laws of the Jim Crow South that dehumanized image bearers of God. Peter himself stood before human authority, a tribunal that told him, to stop talking about Jesus. You remember his reply in Acts 5? We must obey God rather than men. And so obedience to God always supersedes obedience to any human authority. He only told us to fear God. But he did say, honor the emperor which is stunning when you realize the emperor that Peter is talking about was named Nero. And Nero was a nut job. He was a cruel, evil tyrant. But the truth is God's people have a long history of being a blessing to governments that are led by corrupt leaders. Joseph blessed Egypt serving under an idol worshiper called Pharaoh. And Daniel blessed Babylon serving under an egomaniac named Nebuchadnezzar. You see, good citizenship is a part of faithful discipleship. According to Peter, you don't have to like a government official, agree with a government official. You don't have to vote for a government official. But you do have to show proper respect and honor. And this is so critical. What witness do Christians give our neighbors when it comes to the political realm? I promise you, every senior pastor in America is fearing 2024, an election year, and wondering how are my people going to behave, particularly when it comes to social media platforms. So let me remind you, we are supposed to silence foolish talk, not spread it. And if that feels awkward, it gets harder. Let's keep reading. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable 
If someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. I hope you felt as awkward hearing those words as I did reading them. Now, it's important to understand that the slavery Peter is addressing bears little resemblance to the chattel slavery that blights the history of our own nation. The slavery in Peter's day was not race-based. It was often not for life. It typically involved wages, and it rarely divided families. The New Testament has strong words about how masters should treat their slaves, and it encourages slaves to gain their freedom whenever possible. And it's important to remember that wherever the gospel has gone in the world, the seeds of abolition have been sown. That the great abolition movements of history have been inspired and led by Christian thought and leaders. And still, a slave is a slave is a slave a human being owned by a human being. There are no good kinds of slavery. Every form is repugnant. Peter is not endorsing the practice of slavery. He is acknowledging it. There were 60 million slaves in the empire in Peter's day. And the practice factored into every single aspect of their economy. In construction, in shipping, in farming, in marketplace, in education, they could not imagine a world that did not depend on the practice of slavery. And it is into that world that Peter is writing because he knows the talk on the street is that if a slave embraces faith in Jesus, they will probably become insolent and disrespectful and unproductive. And Peter says, we must shut that talk up. And so he reminds slaves who have become Christians to serve in reverent fear of God. Even as he regretfully admits the possibility that some might be punished unfairly. And he says, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And it hurts my spirit just reading those words. Why didn't I let Taylor preach this text? And since we're already in choppy water, let's get deeper. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now again, hear his words in his world. And in his world, it was the un questioned assumption that the wife would take on the religion of the husband. She would worship his God. She would make sacrifices to his idols and she would attend his temples. Even in the New Testament, you'll see often it says a man will accept Christ, be baptized, and it will say next and all his household along with him. And so you've got to understand that when the word on the street got out, that there are some women who are going to these little house churches 
without their husbands to worship a different God? This was unprecedented. It was scandalous. And it caused the church to be called a cult that was trying to divide families. And Peter says, we must shut this talk up. And so he does not counsel leaving. I know of no place in the Bible that says if your mate is not a believer, you have a right to leave them. And he does not counsel lecturing. In my 40 years of pastoring, I have yet to meet a person who was nagged into the kingdom of God. What he says is, let them be won over without words when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. He says, my Christian sisters, your husband might be blind to your God, but he's not blind to good. Let him see that your new faith has brought nothing but good to your family. Now, let me be quick to add that nowhere does the Bible command husbands to rule their wives. In fact, in the first century, a new way to do marriage was presented that was absolutely revolutionary. Husbands and wives submitting to each other. One of the most radical verses in the Bible is what Paul said to Christian marriages, Ephesians 5.21. You submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so Christian husbands and wives love under each other. They don't lord over each other. And Peter does have a strong word for Christian husbands. He says in verse 7, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. He says, husbands, do you want God to pay attention to you? Well, you better know he's paying attention to how you treat your wife. You don't love God if you never talk to him and you can't talk to him if you don't love your wife because God won't be listening. Now, it would be ideal if churches were just filled with only equally yoked marriages, husbands and wives full of Christ just submitting to each other. But Peter is not writing to ideal churches as if any has ever existed. He is instructing Christian wives who are married to non-Christian husbands And saying, submit to them. Now, again, be clear. He is not doing so at the cost of disobeying Christ. Submission never means you sin against God. And let me be clear. There is no biblical support for the idea that anyone should stay in a relationship that is abusive. I have heard of some churches, not many, that have taught that if you are in a relationship where abuse is taking place, you are supposed to stay and submit. This ain't one of those churches. No leader in this church will tell anyone that they should have to tolerate abuse. But Peter is calling on these women to do what is right and not give way to fear. Trust God, do good, don't be afraid to live this way. He mentioned Sarah, but actually Sarah is not his ultimate example of how to be a wife. In fact, for all three of these groups in these tough situations, he's going to emphasize the living hope we have in the calling that was modeled by Jesus. You cannot appreciate these three paragraphs I've read If we don't go back and read the paragraph that is right in the middle. Because everything he says hinges on you understanding this paragraph. So look at it with me. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin 
and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter understands why anyone in any of those three situations could say, this isn't fair. And he might respond, but what was fair about the way Jesus got treated? And let's be clear, no one has ever submitted more than Jesus. And to this, he says, you were called. Here's what I think he's trying to say in one sentence. That we are called to respond to mistreatment in the odd way of the cross. See, grace is foreign. Grace is strange. Grace is alien. Grace is not fair. And when I am mistreated, I want my fair. I want to respond in the flesh, not in the odd way of the cross. And so, for the next few moments, I am going to be unusually vulnerable. Because I am not a plastic Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus that wrestles with these decisions just like you do. 2020 was the single hardest ministry year of my life. I did not take a class in seminary, how to lead a church through a pandemic. Every week I had to make decisions about what we would do as a church knowing it didn't matter what I decided. Somebody was going to criticize me. I did expect the criticism. I did not expect the contempt. People I have preached to and loved for over 20 years felt entitled to go on public social media platforms and call me out, not just question my judgment, but question my character and attack me, not for my theological convictions, but because of their political opinions. And it hurt. And during that same year, my father's journey down the dementia road reached the point that we could not take care of him anymore. We needed help. And we had to make the excruciating decision to place him in a memory care center. And I'm just going to be real honest. You know I love my dad. And I've tried to honor my dad. But these last two years have been hard. Dementia is a terrible disease, and it changes people. And there were many times when my father acted and spoke in ways completely out of character for the man who raised me. And there were times, many times, when my father said things to me no son should ever have to hear. And I know it was not my dad. I know it was the disease. But the words still hurt. And there was a day when he had been particularly ugly to me and to my sweet wife. And we were talking to the administrator of the facility asking, how do we handle this? And I was angry. I was at this point, both church and family, emotionally empty. And I said, the next time he behaves this way, I think I just need to let him have it. What do you think? And she said, it will make you feel good, but it won't do any good. 
And in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I realized her words were not just for my dad. It was for my whole role as pastor to a church I was called to love. And immediately, the Holy Spirit put in my mind, James 1 verse 20. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. It doesn't. It will make you feel good, but it doesn't do good. You see, in the context of submitting to unfairness and mistreatment, God did something redemptive through the suffering of Jesus. So the question Peter is asking is, does our living hope grounded in the resurrection of Jesus fuel our belief that God could do something redemptive when we're mistreated if we respond in the odd way of the cross? And what would that look like? We don't have to wonder, Peter tells us. He wraps up this section, finally, all of you. Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because here's that phrase again. To this you were called. So that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Even if they think they have a right to. See, none of us live ideal lives. All of us have situations in our life that aren't fair and they're not about to change. All of us have people in our lives that are difficult and they're not about to change either. And what we must ask is, what is it like to follow Jesus where we are, not where we wish we were? With the teacher that picks on you, the coach that cusses you out more than the other players, the neighbor that is just a jerk, the boss that is harsh, that person we all have in our families that we hope doesn't show up at Thanksgiving. <laughs> How are we going to follow Jesus where we are, not where we wish we were? And here's what I think Peter is saying. Always try to bless your address, even when it's a mess. Have you ever regretted a time when you just gave somebody a piece of your mind? Because I have. Have you ever regretted a time when you gave someone a blessing, even if they didn't deserve it, because I haven't. We will never silence foolish talk by exploding, but we might by enduring in the odd way of Jesus. That's what happened in 2020 in Central Park, New York was being ravaged by COVID. Hospitals were overrun. They couldn't pay doctors enough to show up. And a group of Christian doctors and nurses from across the country got the crazy idea to set up a tent city in Central Park and set up 68 beds where they served particularly people who were immigrants and under-resourced minorities who could not pay for free. They served people with covid and prayed with them if they asked. Now, of course, this was controversial. They were criticized by the New York Times and by Mayor Bill de Blasio. But they just kept doing good. And people noticed. Restaurants started bringing them free food. 
New Yorkers started lining up outside the tents so that when the doctors and nurses got off shift, they would hear applause. In fact, I'll tell you a secret the New York Times would never report. But Mayor de Blasio showed up with gourmet pies to thank the doctors and nurses. There is a Christian way to shut people up. But it takes living hope in the odd way of Jesus. Do you have that? So I like to pray over you as I close. Today, my prayer is a classic prayer of the church from Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.